All right, everyone, welcome back to another special edition of We Rise Fighting Labor podcast. Today we are talking with Jeff Kurtz. He is a trustee with Railway Workers United. He's based out of Iowa, and he's here to inform us further on what's been happening with the railway strike or railway struggle, you know, where things go from here, and, you know, just kind of clear things up from from what's happening in the mainstream media. Uh, So, Jeff, uh, welcome. We're happy to have you here. Can you give us a little background on who you are, how you got involved uh, in your union, um, how you became a train engineer, all that jazz? Oh, sure. Uh, thank you, Rick. And thank you for having me on today. Uh, my name's Jeff Kurtz. Um, I'm a third, I was a third generation railroader. My grandfather was a conductor with the um, Santa Fe Railroad. My dad was a locomotive engineer. Um, I hired out in 1974. And I, I was a union officer most of my life or most of my career with the, uh, um, with the BLET and, uh, you know, two positions I held. One was uh, I was the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen's uh, legislative director here in Iowa for 10 years. Uh, we took care of uh, legislative and safety matters. And I was president of our local for eight years. Um, and I, uh, I came from a decidedly middle-class background, you know, my, my, uh, dad being a, a local locomotive engineer. And back then the, the railroad was the cream of the crop as far as, uh, middle-class, uh, American jobs. And, uh, we're here today to talk about why that isn't true anymore. No doubt. Um, you know, right before you were, <clears throat> right before you jumped on, we were just shooting some questions around. We were wondering, um, you know, Brian had connected with you about an event that's taking place in Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, namely, we're going out for Solidarity Day on December 17th. Um, and I know that he had chatted with you about it. So, you know, he had informed, informed us that you're going to get some folks to come from Iowa to go to the Racine event. Uh, I was wondering why is that necessary these days? You know, why, to tell, if you could talk to that, speak to that solidarity a little bit. What's what's going on? What are we building? And, and uh, yeah, it, it's solely about solidarity. Um, we are doing it because 20 miles north of us in Burlington, Iowa, is a, a Case New Holland plant that's, that is on strike too. They went on strike at the same time as, as uh, Racine did. They've been out for seven months. Uh, the, th- the thing people don't realize is uh, a lot of people that aren't in the union movement don't realize is that when things like this happen, it it not only affects the, the worker that's working there and their families, but it affects their communities. I mean, these people usually are, you know, uh, they're top of the line people. They, they coach little legs. They... Uh, um, they're uh, the women. They they'll uh, take care of like Girl Scouts. Uh, we we have uh, union members that actually run for for public office, which we need more of those. Um, and to uh, try to starve these people out like they are is just wrong. So we're gonna we're gonna get a uh, hopefully we're gonna have some people come up from uh, Fort Madison and Burlington. I'm with the I'm also with the Lee County. Uh, labor chapter. I'm a trustee there, but uh, uh, we we hope to come up with people from Fort Madison and the surrounding area and show solidarity. And right now we're in the process of piggybacking on what uh, Racine is doing. And hopefully the next day, we're going to have our own event here in Burlington, Iowa to uh, recognize these people. We want to call it the um, uh, let me see. What are we calling it? The the uh, rally for the forgotten, because we want to recognize other unions that have been out a long time, and right nobody's doing anything about it. So uh, we want to keep that in the in the public eye, because these, like I said, these people are very important to their communities, to their families, and um, you know, I I think uh, corporate America needs to recognize this. Hey, brother so Jeff, I got a, I got a quick question for you. Somebody sent me a 
a picture of a flyer for a December 13th uh, solidarity rally with RRU somewhere, but it was it had no location on it. Are you organizing rallies like that around the country in the next week or two? Uh, yeah, and I saw that too. And I'm not sure where that is. Uh, it's right now we've got uh, our media committee with RWU is doing all kinds of media right now. And uh, some of the members have actually gotten sick. So I, I, I'm not sure there's a bug going around right now that's pretty bad. And yeah. so, you know, it, we're our communication right now is a little bit, uh, uh, it's, it's not the best. But uh, I, I will try to find out about that because I, I saw the same thing and I was looking for a location on it and I don't know where it is. Generally speaking, uh, how's the solidarity picking up around the country? You're getting uh, the kind of support you think is going to get us over the uh, finish line with this? Uh, I'm, <clears throat> I'm afraid the only thing that we're going to get is what they've given us so far, they might get get the seven sick days. But the I, I think the real story is the fact that it, it's not the seven sick days. It's not even the paid sick days. It's the days off period. These people, uh, most especially conductors and engineers, but uh, I'll throw in um, maintenance away and uh, the signal maintainers, people like that. We, we've got no set schedules. And what, what it used to be, I'll have to go through the history of this, <clears throat> but when I hired out in 1974, if you needed time off, you took time off. And uh, you just you'd call up. Uh, the phrase that you would use is mark me off. And they, they had a board with uh, people's names on it, and they took you off that board. So it, it was as easy as that. You could stay off up to nine days. Um, I was I happened to be here for the birth of uh, all three of my children. I uh, I did miss some things, but and that that was explained to us when we took the job, and I knew it too. You know, with with my grandfather and my father, I I knew that was going to happen. But you didn't miss everything. Um, you got to be at the important events in your life and your family's life. And uh, um, like I said, I, I uh, coached baseball. I was the president of the wrestling club here. I did a lot of things. Uh, I was in uh, community theater for, for years and years and years. But uh, the, the people that work out there now can't do that. Uh, because, uh, and like I said, I'm gonna go through a little history here. Back in 19, 99, I believe, uh, the BNSF decided that they were going to go uh, start um, penalizing people for, for taking off. And at, at the time, they described what they were doing as draconian, and it wasn't, it wasn't near like it is now. But um, what they did was um, they took this to arbitration. And when they took it to arbitration, uh, the, the two sides argued, and this ruling that they, and this is why people hate, uh, you know, it, it, the union members hate arbitration because you get goofy rulings like this. You get people that are arbitrators that don't understand how we work. So I, I want to read from hey, this hey, because Jeff. I want to make sure this is right. Jeff. But, um, Jeff, can I pause you for one second? Just real quick for the benefit of our listeners, because some I know arbitration will be a new concept to them. If you could just real quick tell us what arbitration looks like. That's when the union sits down with the bosses and. Okay, uh, yeah, arbitration in the in the rail industry is uh, a process where, because of the Railway Labor Act, uh, labor can't go. I mean, it's extremely difficult, as you've seen during this this process. It's extremely difficult for um, uh, labor to go on strike. And they, <laughs> I, I saw in one publication, they said, well, what the, the Railway Lo Labor Act was, was uh, a roadmap to peace. And I thought, yeah, it was a roadmap to peace uh, along the lines of 
the U.S. government uh, signing peace treaties with Native, Native Americans. You know, it was more of uh, we got these agreements and at some point in the future, we're going to break them. So this is this is basically what happens in the rail industry. And that's why a lot of what happened in this contract is so bad because nothing that there are so many open ended discussions that need to happen because of this contract. But to get back to um, arbitration, um, since we can't go on strike, a lot of these issues will sit there and fester for years and years and years. And uh, finally, in 1999, the um, uh, this uh, what, what we were talking about, the uh, attendance policies uh, came up to an arbitrator. We had the, the unions uh, arguing that this needed to be negotiated and uh, the carriers said, no, this doesn't need to be negotiated. We should be able to, to uh, adjust our own people's schedules. And so um, this, is, this is the part I wanna read from the arbitrator because uh, this is really, really bad. And what happens in an arbitration case, once you get a ruling, that's it. And, you know, it's, it's uh, like you agreed to it. So this, like this ruling went completely against the unions, which a lot of arbitration rulings do go against the unions. You've got no recourse after that because it's just like you signed on the dotted line for whatever you just arbitrated. So anyway, the, the uh, attendance policies in 1999, um, what, what happened uh, while allowing the BNSF to improve the policy, the arbitrator wrote that the BNSF violated the spirit of work rest guidelines in the National Wage and Rules Panel by the unilateral promulgation of the 1999 availability policy. And what, what happens as far as when uh, a carrier uh, promulgates the rules, they just arbitrarily make their own rules. And that's basically what happened. I mean, it, this whole thing sounds kind of bizarre because real labor is really bizarre. But uh, the, uh, they, the carriers promulgated the rules back in 1972. And um, the arbitrator reinstated all the... Uh, all the rules that the carriers promulgated, but they never paid for any of the violations that they uh, they accrued during that time. And so they're, uh, they basically in 1999 uh, promulgated the rules as far as uh, availability. And uh, it goes on to say, um, the arbitrator added that uh, certain provisions of the policy have the flavor of unreasonableness. Nevertheless, in truly convoluted fashion, he went on to rule that because the policy had not yet been implemented, he made no finding on whether it uh, was reasonable or not. So basically he said, um, since they haven't implemented this unreasonable policy, uh, I'm not gonna make a ruling. And so the carriers took that as uh, well, we can do whatever they want. They implemented the policy. And from then on, things went downhill as far as, as um, availability. In 2008, uh, if I, and I think that Chatsworth, Chatsworth accident was in 2007. It was a, a commuter train, supposedly that ran a, a red signal, uh, ran into the side of Union Pacific train and a bunch of people got killed. That spurred the passing of the um, Rail Safety Improvement Act in 2008, which the Rail Safety Improvement Act um, designated the Secretary of Transportation as the guy that the railroads had to go to as far as when, it, when they wanted to change scheduling. And so in other words, in the way I read this, I don't know how you could read it any other way, but when they changed their uh, their policies as far as attendance and availability, they should have uh, cleared this first with the Secretary of Transportation, which there's been numerous attendance policies that have been implemented since 2008 that arbitrators have left stand. 
And uh, I, I'm not sure why uh, the Obama administration or the Biden administration has never come out and said, OK, um, now we're going to we're going to get together and we're going to figure out a, a decent attendance policy that these people can follow so that they can have a life when they're not working on the railroad. Um, they've never done that in 14 years. And I, I don't understand this. I, 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 in fact, I've had people that have asked me when the BNSF implemented the high vis policy, why they weren't following the 2008 uh, Rail Safety Improvement Act. And to tell you the truth, I don't know. Um, and this is, like I said, the, the whole thing and this, what we've been talking about as far as the seven personal days, that's only a half a day a month. And I think these guys would be willing, in fact, I know the people that I talk to would be willing to take that off the table if they got something that was reasonable as far as taking time off. But I mean, we uh, around here, there was a case just a couple of months ago of a guy that got in a car wreck and he was going to work. He was a mile away. A woman pulled out in front of him, uh, totaled his car out, and they didn't let him go to work. And they um, penalized this guy. They took points away from him. Uh, they've taken points away from people that are sick or that have sick spouses, sick parents. Um, and it's just, it's brutal. It's just brutal. And uh, we, we've had four people that have actually died in this area, and I attribute those deaths to uh, this policy because they, a uh, couple of them died on locomotives. One guy had a stroke and another guy had a heart attack, and they delayed going to the doctor because of this policy. But this is, this is what people aren't understanding. They think it's all about, well, if you get the flu, you, you want to take a couple of days off. No, it's they want to take time off to be with their families, to live their lives. That, that is the crux of the situation. And until we get that figured out, uh, there's not going to be any rail piece. So Jeff, that, that, uh, what you said is sparking a national conversation. I think many folks did not know the, these conditions that you described, especially being in the United States with the act, and uh, the largest industrialized capitalist country on earth, uh, having a railway system like this that is privatized in the conditions that exist and forcing this national conversation has been quite something over the past months here with Rare Work Workers United and many other uh, unions supporting you and labor and community organizations. And uh, this is happening across the country just in the last couple of weeks, there's been solidarity rallies and other actions taking place. Uh, could you speak to that a little bit about, about the, um, the national conversation that has been forced here and, and, the, and, the, and the support that you're receiving from the public uh, in this conversation and in this struggle. Well, and, and I think uh, once people, I mean, people have really rallied around us just over the sick days, but I think if people understood that these people that work out there, they just want time off to live their lives. I think they'd even get more sympathy, you know, because uh, a lot of them that I talked to said, you know, I, we, we would like to go back to the system we had because it worked. Uh, it, you know, when you could take off when you needed to, for example, um, I was involved in seven crossing accidents in my career. And there, there were times, you know, it's just like the walls are closing in on you and you, you've got to take off. I mean, you need three or four days to decompress, be with your family, do some happy stuff. Um, you know, the, the rail industry and, and this job is unlike almost any other job that you can imagine because of the, the schedules we work and the fact that, uh, you know, when, when you come home and you're off, your, your time off might, is probably not your time because after you, fulfill your federal rest, you can be called at any time. And you've got to be ready to go to work within 90 minutes to two hours. So you may think that you're going to go to work at seven o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden you get called for eight o'clock at night. 
And to show you how how bad this whole system is, um, they with the, the uh, Rail Safety Improvement Act that they passed in 2008, they said after five, uh, five trips, which would be anywhere between 30 to 48 hours long, but after five of those trips, if you didn't have 24 hours off, then you would get uh, 48 hours off when you got in on your fifth trip. If you had to make a sixth trip, say you were away from home and uh, you came home, then you'd get 72 hours. Um, the problem with that is if you were off, say you got off at six o'clock one morning and you were scheduled to go to work at 10 o'clock that night, what would happen, say there, there was a derailment or uh, just trains didn't show up because the lineups are notoriously bad. And that's what we live and die by is train lineups uh, showing when trains might come in. But say that you got in at six o'clock and you were supposed to get out at 10 o'clock and you didn't get out. And I went through this many a time. You'd, you'd wake up in the middle of the night. Did I miss a call? And you'd call up. No, you didn't miss a call. If the next morning, you didn't get out until seven o'clock in the morning. Uh, guess what? Your 24 hours was fulfilled in that time. That was your time off. You didn't know it was, but that's your time off. And in fact, you can have that time off. You can be in the away from home terminal like I worked into Chicago. And if you're 24 hours or more in that terminal, that's your day off. It's, it's a bizarre system. And... Uh, I, you know, they thought of so many loopholes to give the carriers on this that a lot of times it, it just, you know, the, they say that we have this stuff and, and that's the way it is with this new contract. They say, oh, you know, you, you've got uh, time off to go to the doctor. Well, you, you look at what the president and uh, Secretary Walsh negotiated. They negotiated three events a year that you could go to the doctor. So you can go to the doctor three times. Now they said you had to give 30 days notice to the carrier to go to the doctor. Now this is, this is people that have no schedule. So I, I'm not sure how you know where you're gonna be 30 days from whenever. You know, this, this, it's, it's unworkable for about 80% of the people out there. And then they said you could only schedule it on a Tuesday Wednesday or Thursday. I mean, it, it, to me, this was a step backwards. Uh, what, you know, they, they said, oh, it's better than it was. No, it's not. This was a step backwards because the president and uh, the secretary of, of uh, labor just put our employer in between the employees and their health care. I, I don't know how else you, you would put it, but uh, they, they did that. And I think that's wrong. So, and, and there's there's other things that they, uh, you know, they they one of the other breakthroughs that uh, apparently was in this this uh, new agreement that was negotiated by the president and Secretary Walsh was um, that uh, the carriers promised that they would not punish you if you were in the hospital. Now that's a breakthrough in 1880. 2022, I'm sorry. It, it's, it's not. And in fact, like I said, I, I think this is a step backwards because we say it's it's all right to do this. But in this case, we're going to make an agreement that it's not. So there's just so many things that happen in, in this agreement. And, and, you know, when you when the only thing you're talking about is six, sick days, people don't understand, you know, how bad this thing was. And it all, it all starts, this was the Biden uh, presidential emergency board that uh, recommended a lot of this stuff. Hey, Jeff, and, Jeff, can I ask you a quick question sure. as you're going on with this uh, history? Uh, I, I know on your, you list a, a number of affiliated supporting union organizations on, on the RRU webpage. Uh, one of them is the ILWU on the West Coast, which is, I believe is working without a contract now. And I've also noticed that a couple of, uh, of, of the unions uh, are also affiliated with the Teamsters. And uh, uh, 
Uh, Sean O'Brien, the new president of the Teamsters, has been, you know, talking seriously about a major strike next year uh, for UPS. And he and Sarah Nelson of the flight attendants have been dropping the notion of a general strike in the speeches they've been making around the country. Are you in conversations with any of these folks like the Teamsters or ILWU in terms of the relationship you may have with them as we're going forward with this campaign? Uh, ILWU, yes, we do talk to them. I, um, I haven't personally talked to them. Ron does, but we were, uh, we, we do uh, talk to them quite a bit. Sean O'Brien, um, no, we, we haven't talked to him. Um, I'd, I'd like to have seen uh, President O'Brien be a little more forceful. And, you know, it, it seemed at time at times that uh, some of the union leadership, and, and, you know, just full disclosure, I was a teamster. You know, the BLET is part of the... Uh, Teamster um, uh, Rail Conference, but uh, I, I would like to have seen our um, union leadership be a little more forceful on this and bring out some of the other issues. You know, the the uh, the time. I know they they talked about time off, but they talk talk about it mostly in terms of the seven sick days. These people need to be able to take off more than these seven sick days, you know, there's, there needs to be uh, something in there. And I would have some suggestions on how to, how to codify this a little bit better, but uh, they, they need to do a better job, I think. Jeff, question for me. Um, you know, we've seen the events unfold, you know, we saw how Congress voted and how Biden uh, signed, you know, essentially telling workers to get back to work. Uh, what's next? What's what's forward? What's next for Railway Workers United? What's next for rail railway unions in general? Um, just as far as like labor action, labor labor stuff, mobilizing stuff. Uh, I I think um, RWU we we want to keep this we want to keep these issues front and center because uh, a, a lot of the attendance issues are not just rail issues. Uh, for example, Warrior Met Coal. They were, um, they, they've got an attendance policy with points and things like that. Um, and I'm trying to think, I, I, I think doesn't the UAW um, in Racine and in Burlington, don't they have some kind of attendance policy with points too? I thought I, thought I read that. I'm, I'm unaware myself if there is. Okay, I'll talk to the local people about that. But the the thing is, uh, this will spread if you know if they do it with the railroaders, they do this with Warrior Met Coal. Um, this this attendance crap will spread because it really is. It it helps a lot of these corporations if they can if they can keep these people on a tether. You know if if um, you know they have a machine that goes down. And uh, all of a sudden, they get it back up. You know, if they can, if they can tell these people, hey, when this machine comes up, no matter, we don't care what time it is, you're coming in. If you don't come in, you're gonna, you're gonna be penalized. And I, I can see this, you know, and this is, this is part of the just-in-time production that the whole United States is going through. It's made things a little bit cheaper. But by the same token, it's it's made jobs a lot worse than they, they would be. And what, what we're starting to lose is we're losing that sense of community because, you know, people are working odder hours. They're working more hours. Uh, they can't, they don't have time to go to their union meetings. They don't have time to uh, participate in family life or in any uh, community activities. And it's it's not just like I said, it's not just the workers and their families that suffer. It's whole communities. It's, uh, you know, it divides us. And I, I think that is a lot of the problems that we've had as far as uh, left versus right, because people don't have any time anymore. You know, for the last 40 some odd years, wages did not keep up with productivity or with uh, CEO wages. And 
people were able to get in there and leverage that and say, well, the reason it, it doesn't is this person of color or, or uh, the LGBTQ community, you know, things like that. And people were so desperate, you know, that they they grabbed on to scapegoats like that. You know, and th this is our this is our corporate corporate masters that are are really doing this to us. And they're fomenting this division and, uh, you know, they're getting a lot out of it. You know, they they turn uh, factory workers and railway workers against convenience store workers. I'm sure you've seen that. Um, they've turned uh, uh, people in, in my industry, uh, you know, the, the, some of the management will go up to people that, you know, work all the time and tell them, you know, you, you wouldn't have to work all the time if it wasn't for these guys taking off. So they, they create those divisions. And this is, you know, this is something that we've got to look at as, as unions is that we tend to sell our time instead of saying we need more money because we're more productive. We tend to say, well, you know, if, if you want more money, work more. And that in this country, you know, in the, especially in the last 20 years or so, has created a lot of divisions. And, you know, I, you could probably link that to a lot of social ills. Hey, uh, Jeff, I have another question for you. Um, yeah. RRU has really taken on a lot. Uh, I mean, first of all, you're, you're a cross craft organization. So you've got all the different crafts to, you know, to try to align with and harmonize and get on the same page and all that. Plus you all have your own individual unions, um, you know, realize, you know, that, that you belong to and everything that they may want to do. Uh, so, um, you know, you have a lot. You have a lot to negotiate just internally, so to speak. Uh, how's it going with uh, your all's uh, relationship with your own individual unions? Uh, I've only seen, I think, one union president on TV so far. Uh, There's a brother from the uh, uh, maintenance of way workers, I believe. But other than that, your union presidents and uh, high officers seem to be being excluded. Uh, but how is your relationships with them going? Do you see a lot, any kind of support going on there for you? Oh, well, that's kind of tricky because I I used to, uh, there, there, there were times I did not have the best relationships with uh, uh, people on, on the national level. Um, but from what I'm hearing from these guys, um, they're pretty dissatisfied with their leadership. And we're gonna know more, I think it's the 12th, um, all the votes for the BLET national president, uh, the election. And he, the, our national president is elected by the individual union members. So I think uh, all the ballots have to be postmarked by the 12th. So we should know within a couple of days from the 12th, how they actually feel. There's a gentleman running against uh, Dennis Pierce, who's the national president, who would be, uh, he is a, let me see, I'm, I wanna get his title right. He is the vice local chairman of his uh, local out in Arizona. So if he would win this election, this would be like a, a shop steward coming in and all of a sudden being elected president of the UAW. I think, and just this is purely from the conversations that I've had with people, I think this guy is going to get 40% anyway. And I think there's a chance that he could win because there's a lot of dissatisfaction. And I will keep my personal feelings about some of these people to myself. <laughs> so okay. thank you very much. <laughs> um, we want to be respectful of your time. So I don't know, uh, uh, Brother Rick, if you have anything or you want to wrap it up. Uh, how you sure, yeah, go? I have one final question and we can wrap it up with that. Um, you know, Jeff, there is a lot of stuff going on in labor right now with Amazon workers, with UAW uh, workers on strike. Um, UPS might be uh, negotiating a contract next year. 
or will be negotiating a contract next, next year rather. Um, <clears throat> now with all these struggles coming up, is RWU uh, considering or in talks about connecting these struggles together? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in fact, RWU has been really good about uh, uh, not just connecting with other um, unions and other organizations around the country, uh, they connect internationally too. Um, we've been in, in contact with the uh, train drivers over in uh, Great Britain. Um, I know at the last convention, this, let me see this last June, we had um, uh, some workers from Italy and was it France? So yeah, we're, we've been, and, and I think that's gonna be the key here. I, I think uh, we're gonna have to connect not only with um, other unions here and internationally, but I think we're gonna have to connect with other organizations. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, we should be uh, looking at uh, some of the things that we could do as far as climate change. You know, I, I do work with the Blue Green Alliance too. And I, I think that there, I, in fact, I know that we can create jobs uh, that are clean and green and that pay well, and that will actually enhance our, our supply chain. So um, yeah, we're in, and uh, RWU is at the forefront of that. Uh, a lot of us in RWU belong to uh, an organization called Solutionary Rail, which um, they, they want to electrify the rail system, which would save, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think how many billions of gallons of diesel fuel a year that it would save. Um, I've worked with, uh, like I said, I've worked with the Blue Green Alliance. I worked with a gentleman out in Philadelphia. Uh, he's with the, uh, an outfit called Strategic Rail Finance that has, um, they, they did a, a project in Nevada where they redesigned pretty much the whole transportation system. And he's, you know, he's a, a capitalist, but he recognizes, recognizes the value of labor. So, you know, I, I have no problems with, with somebody like that. We, we do make those connections, yeah. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Jeff. And thank you for everyone who's tuned in today to our show. Uh, tune in again next week for another edition of We Rise Fighting Labor podcast, as always, coming at you with news, analysis, and interview. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us and listening. Have a good day, everyone. Peace and love and solidarity to all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.